More importantly, he's going to give us an update on what's happening on a national level with regards to the stimulus program that the U.S. Congress has been working on with the White House. Senator Romney, thanks so much for joining us. A little closer to home. And uh, fortunately, I have my team all back in, uh, in Washington, D.C., and they're pouring through the uh, documents. It's about a 1,000-page bill at this point. Uh, but it's, uh, it, it hasn't changed pretty dramatically since, uh, uh, since Saturday and Sunday when we thought it was pretty well put to bed, but the Democrats came back and wanted some things that uh, they've been looking for for a long time. So we'll see if we can get it done. I, I, I keep hearing from my team back there uh, and from senators I've spoken with on the phone this afternoon that it's uh, you know, on the two yard line, but it's like, okay, guys, push it through. Do you want me to give you a brief update as what's in it? My guess is the answer is yes to that. Can you hear me uh, speaking? Get, nod your head if you can hear what I'm saying. Okay, I see Natalie's got thumbs up. All right, I'll just give you a quick uh, rundown of what's in the bill. There are three major parts. Uh, the first part is for individuals, and that was the task force I was on. Uh, we provide $1,200 per adult. And um, if there are two adults in the home, that's obviously twice that amount, an additional $500 per child. That's a check that should be coming out for the IRS. They'll get them out as fast as they can. Uh, but it could take a couple of weeks before they're able to put the system together to send those checks out. Uh, individuals who have not filed with the IRS, perhaps someone who's on Social Security will also get those checks. Uh, veterans will get those checks. I'm sure there will be some people left out. Uh, homeless people, for instance, uh, are not in the system and won't get the checks. But overwhelmingly, our population will all get those checks. And the purpose of them uh, is designed to have money in people's pockets so that when the economy opens up again, people can feel like going out and buying stuff. So it's to encourage the economy. It's also to help folks who have spent a lot of money stocking their shelves with two to four weeks worth of groceries uh, have some money again so they can keep on buying. There's a second uh, part of this individual portion and that is unemployment insurance. The unemployment insurance rate is gonna go from the fixed number it is now to the full amount of someone's salary or wage. Now that's up to a top point. I think it's $65,000 a year salary, but, uh, but that's a dramatic increase, almost a doubling of unemployment insurance benefits. So people who are unemployed will be able to continue to receive compensation at the level uh, of their current employment. That's part one. Part two relates to small business. And so businesses with 500 employees and less will be able to go to a bank and get a loan approximately two and a half times their, their payroll uh, for a uh, two uh, for a weekly period, they get a two and a half times that amount they can borrow, uh, and I, that not, that number is going to change as to how much they can borrow. But they can use this money to continue to pay their employees and pay their rent and a few other qualified expenses. If they use the money for those qualified purposes, the loan will be forgiven. It's guaranteed by the SBA. The bank takes no risk. Uh, the bank will get a fee for having originated it uh, and servicing it, but there will be uh, they'll be forgiven. Uh, so this is obviously going to be a, a big plus. Now, to qualify to get that loan, uh, I believe a, a small business is going to have to show that its, uh, its revenues have been impacted by the COVID-19 uh, virus. I, I don't know what the percent decline will have to be, but it'll be year on year, month to month comparisons, March this year versus March a year ago. Again, the details of that are being worked out. Uh, that's the small business portion. Then there are larger businesses that are feeling the uh, stress from COVID-19. And $500 billion has been put aside uh, in a fund, which is at Treasury. And, uh, and the Federal Reserve will use $450 billion of that amount to, uh, to go to banks so that banks can again make loans to, uh, to larger corporations. These loans, uh, the terms of these loans are uncertain at this point. They're, we've been going back and forth. Uh, there's been some discussion about whether they should be grants uh, or loans that are forgiven uh, in the same way as the small businesses are being forgiven. Uh, there are others who think, no, they should be at market rates uh, based upon what the market was before the, the crisis hit. So uh, discussion about those things is underway. But net net, uh, it's going to be a, about a $2 trillion program uh, that will be uh, aimed at those three areas. Uh, I'll mention also there's going to be a substantial payment to states, uh, states that have additional uh, obligations as a result of this. Uh, this crisis will receive a lot of money. Uh, the, the number is approximately $200 billion right now. Uh, hospitals also, there's about $75 billion that's being put aside for hospitals. Um, 
so uh, at this stage, all the uh, entities in Utah ought to be keeping records of our revenues, our expenses, what's happened to our, uh, our revenues over time in preparation of being able to get to the banks and get loans uh, and get support. So that's the, that's the update. Uh, I, I can't tell you uh, whether it's gonna pass today or tomorrow, but all indications are from both sides that it's gonna pass. Uh, and, uh, and it'll be uh, effectuated as quickly as possibly can be. With that, I'll turn it back to you, Derek. Ah, is that the governor I see there? Maybe not. Oh, it is the governor. Hello, governor. How you doing? Hi. I shouldn't be talking. You sh I should be listening. <laughs> I hope you're getting better. Or, I, well, I hope you don't get sick, I guess is what there we're saying. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Derek, why don't you take it away? I'll, uh, I'll, I'll mute my microphone and turn back to you. Thank you, Senator Romney. Thank you for that overview. Before we go to the governor, I do want to ask you a question. Uh, you are obviously um, not a novice to the finance industry. You understand it probably better than 99.9% .9 of the population. Uh, you also understand how government works, and you're in a unique position because you saw this up front the last time we had this kind of economic uh, sharp decline in 2008. I'd love to get your thoughts. Uh, we, I think we all know that this is a very different uh, cause than 2008, but there must be some lessons learned from 2008 that you're thinking about and applying to our current situation. What, could you share with us what you think those lessons learned are? the economy uh, as the uh, downturn hit its bottom. And, uh, and that's something which we're, uh, we're copying, frankly, in, uh, in the provisions this time. There was also another element in 2008, and that was an inspector general was uh, stood up to oversee the, uh, uh, the appropriate distribution of funds and to make sure that it was not done in a, a fraudulent manner. And, uh, and we have not yet established that in this legislation. A number of us has, have called for a special inspector general to be created. In 2008, there was a $100 million appropriation associated with that inspector general and, uh, uh, and their office. Uh, we'd like to see that happen this time. Whether that happens in the, in the bill right now, give it its uh, speed of passage or not, uh, I can't tell you. But, but there will be an effort to, uh, to oversee what's actually done and to make sure that states are using the money properly, that, uh, that corporations that borrow the money uh, in fact, needed it and that they use it for the purposes they said they were going to use it for, uh, that the forgiveness of loans is as appropriate uh, under the law. So uh, those are obviously two of the, two of the elements. And I'll, I'll tell you that the greatest, um, I think, question mark right now in Washington, uh, beyond this stimulus effort and this, this uh, rescue package, the CARES Act, it's called, uh, is when we begin to uh, slowly return the economy to a more normal uh, status. And you've heard that there's a back and forth on both sides on that. I would tell you that, that uh, I spoke today with the head of the uh, CDC, uh, the, the people in the public health world feel that it's very important to gather uh, data from hospitals across the country to find out just who is going to the hospital by age and by uh, health condition, uh, who is requiring ICU coverage or treatment, uh, and then who's dying. And with that information, we hope to be able to make a more uh, careful calculation of how to return uh, a more normal economic uh, footing. Uh, the, the, uh, the hope is that those of us that are at higher risk will be able to continue to take pretty extreme measures to stay safe. Those that are at lower risk will be able to go to work. But when that, can, when that will happen uh, is uncertain given the, the uh, uh, very limited data that exists right now. And by the way, let me, one more thing I'd like to mention, which is I'd love to get the chance to speak uh, to your members more broadly, both here, but also in rural Utah, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, chambers and, uh, that are also joining this call might help set up some uh, calls across the state so that we can give more information about how to apply for some of these small business loans that are coming up uh, soon. Thanks again, Senator Romney. We know that you, you're busy, you've got a lot going on, so we appreciate that you would take this time with us. Uh, feel free to stay with the, the Zoom call as long as you can, but we know you may need to run. Thank you. I'm, I'm anxious to listen to what the governor has to say. <laughs> I'm anxious to let him hear what Go I ahead, have. Governor. Well, I'm anxious, Senator, to have you hear what I have to say. 
First, let me tell you, thank you. Uh, we appreciate your voice of experience and your voice of reason. Uh, these are uncharted waters. These are very unique times, uh, at least in my lifetime, and you're just about as old as I am. I've never seen anything quite like this. And Utah is tied to the global eco economy and as the world kind of disintegrates economically, it certainly is impacting us here in Utah too, as you know. Um, secondly, uh, I, I appreciate the fact that there's relief and that this is a role that the federal government can play uniquely so better than probably anybody else to help our business and our employees that are suffering. I would just want, want to make one recommendation which I've made to the president and the vice president Whatever monies that you feel like the states are entitled to, at least for the state of Utah, we'd prefer it to come as a block grant. I don't need you to send FEMA people here, as good as they are. I'd prefer to have the money that we can employ our own people, which are probably much closer to knowing what the circumstances are, and I believe much more effective and efficient in how to spend the money. So a block grant approach to the states, I think, is one that's preferable and even the Democrat side, I think, agree with that, by the way. So if you can help with your colleagues to say, give money to the states, do it in a block grant, so we have flexibility to spend it where we need our unique situations are, which what we do in Utah is not what they're doing in California, and they're not the same. So with that, let me just mention to everybody out there listening, uh, again, we're honored to have you on board here today and talk about this challenging times we face. As we all know, the role of government is one to protect its citizens. It's not even a, it's, it's something that should be nonpartisan, public safety, health and welfare of the people of, that we represent is a bipartisan issue. And so we wanna make sure that the people of Utah are, sell, are safe and that they have good health. And right now with the coronavirus, that's a concern that spread, what can we do to, to slow the spread if not stop the spread of coronavirus and keep the health of our people intact. But likewise, what's becoming obvious, uh, I think to most of us, is that running a close second now, maybe surpassing in when it comes to the anxiety level of the people of Utah, is what about a job? Am I gonna lose a job? Am I gonna be able to pay my bills, my mortgage? And so the economic health of the state of Utah is a, is a big concern too. So I just like to suggest to all of us that these are joined at the hip that it's not, can we do one without the other? They need to be done together. Uh, it's a false choice to say we have to either protect the health and let the economy tank or fix the economy and let people die. I don't think that's uh, right or legitimate. And I think in Utah, we can show that you can actually do both. Hence the fact that we have a plan. And we've had, uh, this is a continuation of what we've started three weeks ago. We've had the best and brightest people in our state uh, from business, uh, small and large in all the different sectors of our economy. Uh, we've had good science, uh, good data that's been analyzed by our folks here in the state working with the legislature. Uh, certainly science and medicine is out there helping us in a significant way to give us the facts to help us develop in policy that we can uh, work together on. And that's uh, born this, what we call the Utah Leads uh, Together Plan, which uh, people can get this. You go to coronavirus.utah.gov coronavirus.utah.gov, you'll see this very detailed uh, plan, which is not necessarily a guarantee, but it's a pathway forward. And if we all implement the plan and do our part, we all have a role to play, we can have success here in protecting our people's health and welfare from the coronavirus and stop, uh, st uh, slow that down, certainly, if, and stop it all together over time. But also we can resurrect the economy of Utah and have economic health and well-being. So that's the plan, and we appreciate all those who've worked on this for, so diligent. This last week, uh, we've had the, about 100 people, the best and brightest minds from different walks of life, saying, here's the plan, and, and, uh, and we have some certainty and some, and some opportunities to, in fact, uh, implement this plan in, to our benefit. Let me just say, and I know, Derek, you said this a number of times, I've heard you, this is a living document. Uh, we've got it there so people can read it. They can hopefully understand it, make recommendations, suggestions, if they have questions to ask about it. This is something we want to use as a baseline to improve our uh, plannings going forward. Uh, it's an action document. It has three phases to it. We're in the urgency phase. We want to get to the stabilization phase, which we think we can do in probably four to eight weeks. 
that's doable, and that's realistic, based on analysis and data and, and modeling. Uh, we get the stability phase and we get that done and we start to move into the recovery phase and have the economy to start to grow again. So I'm sure Natalie Gartner is going to give more detail on that, I hope, uh, for people to understand. But please read it. Uh, last but not least, I would just say this. This is an action plan. This is not my plan. This is our plan. Uh, again, uh, wise people have put this together, but it will only work if all of us participate. We can't say, well, let's let everybody else do uh, social distancing. Let's let other people do some of the difficult things and I'll just ignore it. If that happens, this plan won't work. And so we need to have everybody take responsibility to help us implement the plan. We all have a role to play and we have to play that role if we're gonna have success. Last but not least, I'll just say, it's been encouraging to me. I'm optimistic. I really believe this is gonna work, number one, but I'm optimistic about the people of Utah I've seen their character under the crucible of adversity here. Uh, these are challenging, unique times. Uh, but I appreciate the fact, as I've observed over this last couple of weeks, acts of kindness, acts of sacrifice, finding people that are underprivileged that maybe need some help. Maybe it's just bringing a loaf of bread by their home and drop it on their porch. Maybe it's a phone call to say, uh, let me cheer you up. How are things going? Checking in on those who are shut-ins, those who are older. We know that those above 60 have got to take extra caution uh, to isolate themselves. If they have underlying health issues, it makes it even more difficult. So again, uh, we're doing some great things here. And I guess one piece of good news, maybe you haven't talked about this, Derek, but uh, testing has been the big bugaboo across the country. The ability not to test people to find out, do you really have the COVID-19 virus? And so we've been working very hard for these past three weeks to improve our ability to test. Every state and the, and the federal government has been working on this. And the fruits of our labor come in. Last week, we did a few hundred a day. Yesterday, we did 2,625. So we're ramping up our capacity. We appreciate the work of our hospitals. Uh, the University of Utah, ARUP, which is doing a bulk of the lab work. Uh, we've got now new 19 new uh, curbside opportunities to be tested uh, throughout the state and up and down the Wasatch Front. Most all the regions will be covered here by the end of this week. We hope to wrap up the capacity. That's going to allow us to target those, find out who's actually sick, isolate them, which will help us to free up the rest of us to do other things and, and bring the economy back in place. So again, it's, it, we, uh, the, the document is good. It's solid. So people re read it, find out where you play a role, and then play that role. So with that, Derek, we'll turn the time back to you. I'm hopeful, I'm optimistic. This has been a good day. We have a certified plan in place we can all follow. Thank you, Governor, and thanks for your leadership on putting this team together, this task force together. And as you mentioned, we do have Natalie Gochner, a member of the task force uh, who specifically was leading that team and putting the plan together. But before we go to Natalie, um, a question did come in, Senator Romney, while you were presenting, and I think it's an important question and uh, deals specifically with the legislation that uh, the U.S. Senate is considering, and it has to do uh, with those independent contractors, the so-called gig economy, or those people who are working who may not be eligible for unemployment insurance. Is that part of the conversation that's taking place in the halls of the U.S. Senate and what might be done for those workers? Senator, take, there you go. You're off. Yeah, you. Go ahead. There, all right. There, there is an effort. They are specifically recognized in the legislation. There is an effort to find a way to help those uh, uh, the people who work in the gig economy, uh, independent contractors, sole uh, proprietors, and so forth. They are all covered under the legislation, uh, either with uh, within the unemployment insurance scheme or instead in the small business scheme. So uh, one or the other. Uh, provisions will be able to cover those individuals. That is what's that is one of the priorities that was put in the legislation. Uh, frankly, Susan Collins was the one who championed that effort, and I believe uh, we'll see in the final legislation that that's that that is well encompassed. Great, thank you for that clarification, uh, Natalie. We're going to go to you next. The governor did a wonderful job of teeing up the plan, uh, and I love the way that he said this is our plan. It's not his plan. It's not even the Natalie Gochner plan. Uh, although you were the uh, primary driver of the team that put it together, and thank you for that. But I think it'd be very interesting for our listeners um, to hear about some of the specifics about 
uh, not just the plan itself, but how the plan came together. Thanks for being on with us. Yeah. Happy to do that, Derek. You're hearing me okay? Give me the thumbs up. Great. Uh, thanks, everyone. So I serve as an associate dean in the David Eccles School of Business. I also direct the Kemsey Gardner Policy Institute uh, under the governor's direction and Derek's. I was asked to help with the policy arm of the Economic Response uh, Task Force. Of course, I work at a public university and we have a service mission. And so this is something we're uh, very happy to help with. I participated with a very large group. Many of you were included. Uh, included uh, not only business leaders, nonprofit leaders, uh, but really uh, significant partnerships with the Governor's Office of Management and Budget and the legislative branch to speak specifically to an economic plan that would be helpful. That plan is this, I'm gonna put it up in a minute, but Utah leads together. Uh, and before I put it up, I just wanna uh, point out that the most important economic guidance in the plan is to follow public health guidelines. If we do, the economic impact will be shorter and less acute. We are entering a critical phase of the next 10 days to two weeks. Uh, we're all in this together. If we make sacrifices in the short term, it will, we will do better in the long term. The premise of the plan is that if we provide some stability to uh, business leaders and to um, households through a directionally correct plan, we will be better off. And so I'm gonna go ahead and put this plan up on the screen. I think that will do. And Derek, I'll ask you to confirm that you're seeing it with a thumbs up. Great, okay. So the first thing you see on this plan is right on the front cover. It mentions that it is dynamic. It mentions that it will be monitored daily and updated as required. That's really key because we're in an uncertain environment. And so this is version one. And because this is a data informed plan, it will change based on the monitoring data that the governor just uh, referenced. I'm speaking of testing and tracing and the like. Uh, I'll also highlight that the goal of this plan is to provide Utah businesses and residents with clarity and specifics about the plan for a health and economic recovery. And we make three asks in the plan, rigorously follow public health guidelines, stay engaged with the economy and assist those in need. I think the biggest innovation in the plan, at least from an economic perspective, is to recognize that economies uh, when they're hit with something like a pandemic, they go through an urgent phase. It pauses, it stops. And then you'll move to a stabilization phase and then to a recovery phase. And it's this line of thinking that uh, the plan is based on. Now I'll skip over this testing measure and treatment, but that's not because it's not important. Uh, I'll let you read that in the plan, but I think it's important for business leaders to know that the governor's office in working with the Department of Health and Intermountain Healthcare and University of Utah Health is putting together um, measures that will help us understand what, what, when we're in the urgent phase and when we can start to transition to the stabilization phase. So right now, our goal, uh, you can see on the urgent phase is for it to last eight to 12 weeks uh, starting March 16th. So it's backdated just a little bit when a lot of our urgent public health practices went in place in the state. You can see in uh, the public health practices, we've got testing increases, uh, contact tracing and active monitoring, extensive social distancing, high risk populations stay home, uh, you know, school disruptions, online learning at the universities. And you can see how those have taken place. If you look at the bottom here, there's a measure. It says COVID-19 transmission rate of 1.5 at the beginning and 1.0 at the end. So if I'm person A and I have the virus, Right now we are tracking at 1.5 people will get the virus. That's where you get the exponential from. Uh, during this phase, we have to get it to uh, 1.0 in order to move on to the stabilization phase. Another really important point is under the economic characteristics and practices, I'm circling them there. Uh, this is a very clear message coming out of our state leaders. The Utah economy is open and operating in compliance with specific public health practices and we list every major industry here, but we note that 
there are several industries that are operating under specific restrictions. And then I'll flash forward it here. Right here in the report, we provide the guidelines for, you'll see general guidance and then guidance by industry for what we're asking people to do to uh, engage with the economy safely. Uh, so that's uh, you know really important guidance for our state and specificity, and we think directionally cor correct. And then if you note here, and this is where Senator Romney is being so helpful to us, you'll see public and private solutions during the urgent help. We have aggressive monetary policy, reduced interest rates. I think we'll get forward guidance. Uh, under fiscal and public policy, we note an estimated $2 trillion in aid, uh, and also the work that's being done in uh, research and development. And you'll see the large block grants to states, the SBA cash flow assistance, unemployment insurance, and then you can see some of the things at the state and private level. And let's be clear, a huge part of our recovery will come from private sector innovation. Uh, the governor's office of management budget has a very detailed plan for the urgent phase and they're working on the plan for the other phases, but they have a, a dashboard. Uh, they are, it is all synced to the extensive testing that is going online in our state as we speak. Uh, I believe the testing number is upwards of 4,000 a day at this point, uh, approaching that. I, I won't go into as much detail here on the urgent phase, or sorry, the stabilization phase, but you'll see 10 to 14 weeks is uh, where we're thinking. Uh, the measure here is the COVID-19 transfer rate must be less than one and declining. And if it, you'll see in little small print there, but if we return to uh, you know, one or greater, we will go back to the urgent phase. And then you can see the public and private solutions here. Uh, this is when the fiscal policy, monetary policy start to really take effect. And you're receiving this aid, highly impacted industries are, are receiving aid. Uh, the R&D work continues. There's this cash infused in the economy that coupled with what's happening at state and local private level, it, it starts to help. And uh, hopefully part of what's being communicated is that we have things that we can do as human beings and organized government to help our economy along. We then move to the recovery phase. We think that'll be eight to 10 weeks uh, after uh, the stabilization, stabilization phase ends and it will um, uh, proceed for eight to 10 weeks. Under this phase, we believe we have the virus under control and job growth. Here we're looking for a COVID transfer rate, transmission rate of near zero and you can see some of the things that we would expect to happen under that scenario. I already referenced the things we can do to stay engaged, but there's a lot of specificity in the plan on that. There's also a section on resources for small business owners and employees. Uh, we have a data appendix. Uh, this is something that our state can be very proud of and we can be grateful to our state leaders. We have historic balances in our budget reserve accounts, the rainy day funds. We have an unemployment insurance trust fund that's at a uh, historically high level, over a trillion dollars. And, uh, and then uh, Senator Romney, we did try to detail the monetary policy to date and some of the thoughts we're having on the fiscal policy to date. We should get more detail here in future plans. Uh, I'll just end by saying, here's a, a list of the people and entities that were helpful in pulling this together. Um, I read a report today by McKinsey that talked about time boxing this event, suppressing the virus and shortening the duration. And so this is where it comes back to a little section I'll note here that says um, protecting the hive. Uh, if there's any place where our social capital, our social cohesion, our civic responsibility can shine, it's right now. And it's why we have a governor that's saying times like these bring out the best in people. This is a time for Utah to shine. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Derek. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you for walking us through that. I'm sure that a lot of people have uh, are very interested, may have questions about the report. We want to make sure that people know that you can find the report as well as a one page overview at coronavirus.utah.gov. There's also an email address where you can engage with the task force. Uh, the governor mentioned that this is a Utah recovery plan for all Utahns. And if you would like to give your input to the plan, we would welcome that. You can do so at coronavirus.utah.gov. Speaking of gov, governor, we're gonna go back to you. 
uh, to give you the final word with regards to the plan that you unveiled today. And, and as, a, as your final remarks, say whatever you wanted to say, but there's one thing that I think it's important for people to hear you say, and that is, when did this plan start? We said it was announced today, doesn't mean that it started today. Go ahead. Well, thank you, Derek. As you know, I've got to jump off. I've got my day job here. I've got 500 bills have just been dropped on my lap that I've got to get through in the next eight days that the legislature's provided for me to review and decide what to do with. So I've got to go to that next meeting. But um, let me just say, this is not something that was invented over the weekend. Uh, we've been working on these issues. In fact, uh, the, a lot of what you see in the document or uh, kind of phraseology that we've used in the past about isolation and, and testing and, and uh, making sure we avoid large crowds and we've moved that to public school closing and, and isolation when it comes to restaurants and those kinds of things. That's been started three weeks ago when we started our first task force chaired by the Lieutenant Governor and even prior to that. But it's been ramped up. And again, your committee's done great work to get us to the point we're at today. And again, this is the most comprehensive plan of any state in America today. There's more uh, substance to it. There's detail. It is a, clearly a pathway for a plan for us to attack this issue at two fronts on the health issues for the people of Utah and also economic recovery at the same time. And they're joined together, as I mentioned. So the most comprehensive plan in America is this one. I'd like to give a shout out not only to Natalie, who's done yeoman's work and the people that are associated with that effort in your committee, Derek, a uh, hundred people from different walks of life all coming together, which is kind of an emblematic of the state of Utah needing to come together, but also to Kristen Cox, who's the director of our Office of Management and Budget, uh, a very detail-oriented person, uh, part of her efforts uh, helping us be more efficient as a government, is a uh, very significant analysis, uh, looking at the data, making sure that what we do has a return on investment and what the outcomes are. So I appreciate Kristen's work along with Natalie and everybody's come together to develop this very comprehensive approach, which I think can be a blueprint for other states to follow. So again, I think that the phrase that we've come up with, Derek, as I recall, is that we want people to in fact uh, uh, adopt. So there's challenges out there to adopt to the new normal, which we have at least for the short term, adopt to innovate find workarounds, find other ways to do things under the new parameters we have out there that will help the economy and help protect the people at the same time. So innovation is a key issue as we adopt to the, to the rules and regulations of today. And lastly, overcome. Adopt, innovate, and overcome the challenges. If we do this, it's not about just knowing, it's about doing. And we've been doing for three weeks. This is a culmination of a lot of efforts with this new written plan. If we do it right, we'll succeed as a state. So thank you, I wish you all adieu and uh, keep up the good work, Derek. Thank you, Governor, and thanks for joining the call. We know you've got to run. Uh, thank you also for mentioning Chris Cox in your Governor's Office of Management and Budget. In fact, next on our next town hall on Thursday, we're gonna have Chris come online and talk about the layer deeper of this plan at the tactical level. So that's a great introduction for next Thursday. Thank you, Governor. At this time, we want to turn to Ryan Starks, who's going to give some information on the uh, SBA loans and what people can do that are on the ground, that are hurting today, that need help today, and help is available. Ryan's gonna tell us about it. Thanks, Ryan. Hi, Derek, thanks for having me on. Can you hear me okay? Great. Well, I just wanna give a big kudos to the governor and lieutenant governor for their leadership and for their willingness to lead out on this effort. And thanks to you and your team as well, Derek. Um, the governor mentioned Natalie Gochner had a part to play in this plan. And we know that if her fingerprints are on any plan, it's gonna be a good plan. I just wanted to spend a few moments today and talk about some of the resources available to small businesses. And in doing so, I just wanna let you know that the governor's office of economic development is very committed and we're working around the clock with so many partners to serve our business community. So we're committed to making sure that they can receive the help that they need. A couple of weeks ago, we had the opportunity to work closely with the governor's office and with the Division of Emergency Management to make sure that we could get a letter prepared from the governor and sent to the SBA 
and we had to prove our case that Utah was in need of some assistance. And so thanks to so many people coming together for Senator Romney's office, for Senator Lee's office, and our other congressional partners, we were able to put Utah in a position to where we could receive this funding. With this funding, what it does is it enables small businesses to apply for low interest loans of up to 30 year terms. For a small business, the rate is 3.75%. And the nice thing about these loans is that nonprofits are also included at 2.75%. And so there's typically about a 15 day turnaround. Businesses can go to sba.gov slash disaster. And there's an application where all 29 counties in Utah are eligible and where businesses can apply for this money. So that's one of the things that we're doing. I don't know if Jana Wilkinson's on the phone or not with me, but she was going to add a little more to that. Jenna is here and we'll turn the mic over to her. Great. So um, I'm Jana Wilkinson with the Utah Division of Emergency Management, and I work in the mitigation and recovery section, and we help to um, get those letters through from the governor to get those programs brought in. Um, for the recovery efforts. And Ryan touched on um, several of the points I had for SBA, um, talking about the interest rate. Um, there is a cap that disaster loans, currently there's a cap that disaster loans are up to 2 million in assistance for small business. Um, all for working capital for small businesses and private nonprofit organizations that received substantial economic injury due to COVID. Um, I saw a few questions popping up um, as we were looking at this in the Q&A, so I thought I'd address a few of those. I think um, some of the comments from uh, Senator Mitt Romney may have uh, caused a little confusion um, and several questions about the interest rate. So Senator Mitt Romney was discussing the stimulus package that the federal government is currently discussing. So they're currently discussing options of making SBA loans interest-free or potentially even making them grants that can be forgiven in certain circumstances. So that's an ongoing conversation for that package. It's not official at this point. So at this point in time, the SBA rates and interest rates are currently still at 3.75% with 2.75% for nonprofits. That may change if that stimulus package goes through. Um, so those who are asking questions about that, how do they know if they qualify for that? Um, that will become forthcoming once the stimulus package is finalized and, and officially put out. Um, Ryan already mentioned the website that uh, businesses can apply to. Unfortunately, the website is a little bit slow. Um, normally when SBA puts these disaster loans out, there's only a few communities around the country that are applying at one time. And currently nearly every state and every county in the country has businesses trying to apply. So it is creating some slowdown and some backlog in the system. If you're having trouble, um, please reach out to their customer service line. It may take a while to get through. Um, or just continue to try back later um, to fill out those applications. We do, we are passing on information from the businesses that have submitted those economic injury worksheets to the state of Utah. We're passing that information on to the SBA and they're trying to follow up with those people that have submitted worksheets. Um, for people that are seeing those requests for those worksheets still out there on Facebook, on LinkedIn, um, as was mentioned earlier, the state and a lot of people got together to get those worksheets in so we could request SBA. Once SBA became official though, those worksheets are not part of the application process and we're only needed to request the SBA loan programs. So if people see those economic injury worksheets or they see them attached with my information to send them to me, those are no longer required. And we suggest that they go to the SBA application website instead. That will be the fastest way that they can receive service and get those loan applications in. Any questions? Jenna, one question that I hear often is clarification on whether nonprofits are eligible. Are they considered small businesses under these SBA disaster loans? Yes. So one thing that SBA has put out in a lot of their material is that they do say small businesses and private nonprofit organizations. I don't have the SBA's official matrix on how they break that down, which exact types of nonprofits, but they do specify that private nonprofit organizations are eligible. Um, I'm not sure where that falls in with government nonprofits. Um, there are some quasi businesses that have some government and nonprofit 
together, but that's something that they should contact the SBA. And if we get any more information on that, um, we can put that out to help clarify that question. Thank you for that clarification. Jenna, you may not be the right one to ask this question to, but I'm gonna, going to ask you anyway. You can defer to Ryan, and if Ryan doesn't know, we'll find the answer down. But a question came in that I think is a very good question. And that is with all these new stimulus programs coming online, including things that you have been talking about, like the SBA loans, do they become mutually exclusive for businesses? For example, if a business applies for an SBA loan, does that mean that it would not be eligible for payroll forgiveness that Senator Romney talked about? I can't answer it completely across all packages. I'm not sure how this state is going to handle funding that they put out. I do know that the federal government um, tends to have guidelines and regulations about um, only providing for need that's not provided for by others. So for businesses that may qualify for small business loans, if those business loans are for specific items that aid from another federal program might cover, they won't receive double aid. They could receive more aid for items that were not covered by the original SBA funding, but they wouldn't be able to receive double funding for that. In general, most federal programs are set up that way. They will help and complement each other, but they won't provide the same aid for the same service. Thank you for that. Ryan, we'll kick it back to you if you have any final comments that you wanted to make. to coordinate all of these federal resources, but on the state level, we're working closely with Salt Lake City who has their own loan program at 0%. And we're pleased to announce that GoEd, under the leadership of Val Hill, is working to create our own fund that'll be available to businesses within the next seven days. This fund will also have a 0% interest rate and it'll be that bridge to help the businesses meet their payroll needs and their other overhead needs until the stimulus package kicks in. That's great news, Ryan. And, and maybe we, uh, when you have that finalized, you can let us know and come back and we'll share that with all the listeners. Will do. In the meantime, Derek, people can go to the coronavirus.utah.gov website or business.utah.gov where we list a number of resources available to businesses. Great, and thank you for reminding everyone of where they can find those resources. Thanks, Ryan, and thanks, Jenna. Uh, we've been talking a lot about small businesses, and now we'd like to talk to, to small business owners, those who are doing exactly what the governor outlined when he said to adapt, to innovate, and to overcome. We've invited Matt Caputo. Everybody knows Caputo's Deli. Matt, thanks for joining us. We'd love to hear from you about what you're doing to stay safe and to stay open for business. Cool, yeah, so, um, you know, we're actually preparing for um, our industry to be hit much, much worse than it was in 2008. I was managing at that time and I remember that. And I think that we'll have in retrospect easily shrugged that off compared to what's coming for our industry. For example, our restaurant sales are down 80% right now. Um, and we're actually have an active delivery and curbside program that's doing quite well. Most restaurants don't have that. Uh, we have a wholesale business. Our wholesale to restaurants is down 95%. Uh, our, on top of that, we have perishable inventory that was set to serve those restaurants that was bought on terms. So we still have to pay for that. Our Caputo's U of U uh, location, because the campus is closed, it's totally closed. Uh, our website, uh, our, or our wholesale company also sells to over 2,000 accounts nationwide. And unfortunately, uh, most of those stores like Caputo's around the country that buy from us have absolutely frozen their payables. Um, so we are not getting paid on things that we've already sold. Uh, our classes, we do four of those, uh, about four a week on average. We're a big revenue center for us, 100% gone. The earthquake shook at least $12,000 uh, off our shelves downtown, uh, the building next door to us. Uh, crumble uh, some of the facade off of it. Luckily, our seismic upgrades we put in when we bought this building, our building seems to be in good shape. Now, there are silver linings, you know, in addition to the restaurant that we have, uh, our locations are also grocery stores. And we happen to specialize in traditionally preserved and nutrient dense foods. 
So our community is showing great support. And in all three of our market locations, sales are up in the market. Also, before this all went down, uh, we had a thriving online business where we're shipping food all over the country. Now it's not just thriving, it's actually booming. Now it's not enough to make up for the lost restaurant sales, but it's a real blessing that we're super happy for. Um, we're very blessed that so far we have not had to lay off or furlough any employees. And despite all these challenges, we have such uh, wind in our sails. We have the best crew ever. It's because of their resilience. Uh, it's absolutely inspiring. Because of their resilience, their work ethic, their flexibility, their can-do attitude, their instant willingness to shift to doing whatever it takes has allowed us to adapt. You know, we have chefs that are now packing online orders. We have cheesemongers that were now instead delivery drivers, things they never signed up for, things they never wanted to do, but people are doing what it takes. So we have temporary bridges uh, that are, are paying dividends. For example, we did a gift card promotion that went live on social media today, where you buy a gift card today, and then for during the holidays, we'll send you gift cards with extra value on it. And that is all sh already showing signs of great success. However, it's not the temporary things that I really wanted to talk about today. More importantly is we are looking at this at Caputo's as an opportunity to really reinvent our services for the next era. And we do think that there's a major paradigm shift for our industry that we will have to live within. So here are some of the things that we are intend to focus on permanently. First and foremost, the market is open. At three locations uh, with the city, our business license is the same as a grocery store. We're listed as grocery food, so we are remaining open. Um, and like I said earlier, we have nutrient dense, traditionally uh, preserved foods. Another thing that we're doing is that we've implemented with our own staff and our own vehicles is delivery to a lot of the areas in Salt Lake with 45 minutes uh, window. Uh, that is both sandwiches and groceries. So someone can order either online or call in and get a delivery to their doorstep uh, within 45 minute time window. We are also offering free shipping via FedEx and USPS uh, inside of Utah. So those that want to order groceries online can do so and get it, expect to get it usually within one business day because Utah's in our one day ground zone. Uh, with the current delays, we're experiencing about one to three days. And that has been really, really popular with people looking to stay home. Um, we're also today putting together virtual our first virtual class using this very program of Zoom. We will be able to host up to 100 attendees where we're gonna be doing a, a cheese uh, tasting where they will sign up in advance uh, pay the normal class fee that we always charge for our everyday classes and receive uh, the cheese in uh, via USPS before. So utilizing the skills uh, and the services that we've already been dabbling in and changing them around, we've been able to uh, maintain uh, our existing uh, workforce. You know, it's a crazy and wild time, but uh, so far, uh, unless there's any more major paradigm shifts or the situation deteriorates further, it looks like Caputo's will live to fight another day. Never worked harder in my life, but we're, we feel really blessed that our crew has just been so adaptive to this. So thank you all for inviting me and that's what we're doing at Caputo's. Thank you, Matt. That is an amazing story. The word you used was inspiring and it is exactly that. And thank you for sharing it. We also have David Utria, who's the president of uh, US Translation, who's agreed to join us for the final few minutes of our program to talk about what he's doing in his business to adapt, to innovate, and overcome. David, thanks for being on. Go ahead. Thanks, Derek, uh, for inviting me to this uh, town hall. Um, this is very important. Um, we are a translation and interpretation company uh, providing services in over 100 languages for uh, corporations um, and government agencies. Uh, we have two divisions. One is our content translation localization, and the uh, second division is our conference interpretation. Our conference interpretation division has been uh, highly impacted due to the cancellation of events. Um, all of our staff are now working remotely, 
from their homes and we are 100% uh, operational. 80% um, of our uh, full-time employees are women and some of them are mothers with the school age children uh, working from their homes. And it has been a challenge uh, uh, for them uh, to be able to do the work that they have to do and also to help their kids with their homework. Um, but we are being very flexible with them and they are quickly adapting to that. We have uh, adapted uh, by using video technology to communicate between staff members and also, uh, also to have company meetings. Uh, so we keep the communication uh, open as much uh, if, we are in, if we were in the office. Uh, uh, communication is, is a key really uh, for us to keep some sanity too. And, uh, and, and, and especially if it's a video conference, it makes a big difference for, uh, so for some reason. Um, since uh, we have been hit so hard on the interpretation side of the business that uh, we have put a huge emphasis on the, on the remote uh, simultaneous interpretation technology. Uh, this technology allows people located anywhere in the world to communicate to their audiences also located anywhere in the world in any language using interpreters who are working remotely from their homes. Uh, no one needs to be in the same place. The only requirement for both the, the, the people, uh, uh, the presenters and also the audience is an internet connection, similar to what we are doing here uh, right now. This is a great solution that we had actually uh, for the last uh, two years but somehow, uh, somehow the people uh, or the, our, our companies or customers have not been very embracing of that. Uh, now, what we are doing is uh, in order to, to keep our employees, uh, especially those that work at this division, uh, all of them are uh, doing marketing basically. Before they were more like a technicians or, or coordinators, uh, but now everybody is doing sales and um, educating our audience about this technology uh, so they can continue doing uh, business uh, internationally. Uh, despite uh, being um, a company that has been self-sufficient for 25 years, we, we never asked for a loan. We have always funded by ourselves all of our investments. Uh, I did apply uh, to the SBA disaster loan. Uh, and, and the main purpose of that is mainly to, to, to keep our employees and to avoid laying them off. Uh, yes, uh, it takes. Um, it took me three hours in my case to do the old application, uh, but it was worth it, and I was able to complete it. And, uh, and it was, uh, and I and I hope to to have some access to these uh, uh, loans if necessary. Uh, so far, we are doing okay. Uh, but I don't know how we are going to be in the next uh, few months if everything continues the way it is. Uh, uh, we are applying the mantra. Uh, of, of uh, adapt, innovate, and overcome every single day. Uh, and, uh, and that has been uh, very inspiring and has been uh, very, uh, very good for us. One thing that I'm doing personally a lot is uh, contacting all of our customers uh, to let them know how important it is for, for they are for us. And, and we are, and, and just by doing some of these one-on-one -on -one, uh, uh, emails or phone calls, I'm getting a lot of traction. It's amazing uh, in this type, uh, these times of uh, of, uh, of uh, severe, um, you know, crisis where we are living. Uh, how people pull together and and those customers that you have been serving for many years, uh, they uh, uh, come back to you and they help you out too. I encourage you, the small businesses that are out there, to do the same thing. Just just communicate. Just talk. Uh, uh, not just with your uh, your employees, but also with your your customers, you're going to get a lot of out of them, uh, even in a form of referrals, where, because sometimes they, they don't have business because they have been impacted too. Uh, and that has been a, a wonderful blessing for us. David, thank you for sharing your story. And thank you for sharing the specific examples of things that you're doing to reach out and keep your customers. Thanks to all of our presenters today. Thanks to everyone who joined us. We wanna make sure that you remember two things. Number one, coronavirus.utah.gov. Go on there and find all the information about the resources we talked about today, including the plan from the Economic Response Task Force that was released today. And number two, we want to remind you that we'll be doing these uh, Zoom calls on Tuesdays and Thursdays 
at 4 p.m. The next one will be on Thursday at 4 p.m. We're going to talk specifically about the tactical level of the economic response plan, and we'll be bringing some experts on, as well as continuing to hear from business owners and what they're doing to adapt, to innovate, and to overcome. Thanks, everyone, for joining us.